So welcome or welcome back to Faith for Friday. For the last case for this week, we are going down to Georgia. Uh, specifically, we're going down to, to this uh, smaller town called Cordell. Uh, I've actually never heard of this town before, so this will be the first time that I've covered a case out of this town. Probably won't be the last, but I've been wanting to cover this one for a while. Yeah, so with it being a small town, um, I highly doubt anyone will actually know anyone that was involved in this case. But if you do, of course, always let me know down below. Try to be respectful because, you know, YouTube restrictions. And so with that being said, I'm going to quit my rambling and let's go and get started. So Janie Lou Hillcox was born on Christmas 1932. So basically December 25th, 1932. And she was the second youngest of five kids. So she was child number four out of five. Um, when she's like 15, she wants to be this, she wants to uh, marry this guy named Charles Gibbs, but he's like 21 and she's like 15. Apparently back then that was like legal. So he was born on June 27th, 1926. And then it said that he served in World War II, but if you do the math, he wouldn't have been able to at least legally fight in World War II to like almost the very end, like literally in 1944. So I would like to believe he was one of the last people that was shipped out before the war ended, if that makes sense. Because he was, he was 13 when the war started. And then when we jumped, when the United States jumped in, he was technically 15, so still underage. And we were still fighting when he turned 18, so he would have to come in at the very end. But it is apparently confirmed that he did, in fact, serve, so. So then with Charles, uh, she gives birth to three sons, Roger, Melvin, and Marvin, in that order. So Roger Luthien, I, I think I said that so wrong. Luthien Gibbs was born on August 2nd, 1948. And then Melvin Wade Gibbs was born on October 15th, 1950. And then Martin Ronald Gibbs was born on June 21st, 1953. So then um, Janie over here, she unfortunately gets diagnosed with like Lou Gehrig's disease. And pretty much that's a condition that like weakens your muscles and it's pretty much almost always fa fatal, uh, especially back then. Maybe now I think it said you can survive it, but back then this is like the 60s. So they weren't as advanced as we are now, obviously. So then she decided, um, since I'm going to die anyway, I'm going to go ahead and um, go ahead and send all my family up there to heaven. So that way when I, when I die, and because I guess she thought she was going to heaven after killing all these people, they're all, they'll already be there waiting for me. So Janie, of course, she goes for Charles, the husband first, and he dies on January 29th, 1966. So on August 29th of the same year, so we're still in 1966, she proceeds to poison Melvin, the middle child. So that he also dies of arsenic. So that apparently while Melvin, while Melvin was like 16, he was dating this uh, girl named Ellen. And apparently Janie didn't like that. So she would uh, casually just poison her son over time. And eventually sometime in like January 1967, he would accuse her of like, I know what you're doing. I know you're trying to poison me. And then unfortunately his accusations of his own mother trying to kill him were put under basically him being delirious and not knowing what he's talking about. So apparently there was like a pitcher of water next to the bed. So if he ever gets thirsty, he can just, I guess, like drink the water from that. And she proceeds to pour that out and puts in her own water, which is mixed with arsenic. And apparently you can't tell like the difference. Obviously there's a difference in taste. So like looks wise, it just looks like real girl water. So then she would claim that she did this because the hospital water had too much sulfur, which apparently that's like something that you don't need when you're dealing with arsenic poisoning. And unfortunately, she would give the glass to Ellen, his girlfriend, the girl that Jane did not approve of. And she gave Ellen the glass that ultimately killed. So then, uh, both life insurances apparently paid like 31 grand. This, that was back then. So obviously, you know, that's a lot more now. Because like I said, it's the late 60s you're talking about. Where things are like obviously more affordable. Like the title says, she gave money to the church. You know, give you a little 10% to the church. Uh, she gave a good 33% of it to the church. So like a good 10 grand. And not like right away, she gave it to like over periods of time and obviously of course if she killed them for the money while she gave us money while she gave to the church money if you know so then she goes and buys a car and a house because like i said things were a lot more cheap back then so then of course uh charles and melvin's deaths are pretty much written off his liver disease and Jan janie somehow had the option to deny an autopsy like they didn't suspect they just said liver disease and just buried him and went on about their lives Roger, who was the oldest, of course, he, by this point, he got married and had a son. And apparently the son's name was, like, Ronnie Edward Gibbs. And then, unfortunately, he dies, like, October 29th, 1967. And he was only a month old when he died. And he was born September 3rd. So, like, literally, like, um, almost, um, almost two months old. But they say a month old. 
So then Roger, the father, uh, Ronnie's father and the oldest of Jenny's offspring, he dies on Christmas Eve, 1967. So then the daughter-in-law, um, Ronnie's wife, well, sorry, Ronnie, okay, so Ronnie, the baby, his mother, and then Roger's wife, she understandably wants an autopsy for all these people because all these people are dying. My husband died. My kid died. It's too much. So then there's an autopsy. All the bodies are dug up. Everybody got arsenic in them. And a lot, and apparently a lot. Like, you could tell it's arsenic because there was a lot. And so then, of course, Jane, she's arrested. So then in February of 1968, she is declared legally legally insane and then until 1976 she's at a mental institution where ironically she's working as a cook she's then found guilty and sentenced to like five life sentences so you already know she ain't she ain't getting out of prison unless she dies at least that was the plan and then like in april 1999 they somehow get Janie out of prison for like a compassion release because apparently she was in the later stages of parkinson's and she was allowed to get out as long as she was under the care of her brother and her sister-in-law. So I guess like her brother's wife. And then also the condition is she had to check in with her parole. She had to check in with her parole officer only once a year. And then of course, as you can imagine, um, she died on February seventh, twenty ten, at age seventy-seven. So Janie is no longer here. So yeah, uh, like I said, definitely know what you think down below. Uh, if you knew anyone, this was an older case. So like I said, late sixties. So if you know anybody, or like, I guess if your parents, maybe even grandparents know anybody involved in this case, definitely know what you think down below. I have sources down below as always, like, like maybe six this week, was not this week, but like for this specific case, because this case wasn't really as much talked about as I thought it would be, considering that she was donating money to the church to like keep suspicion off her. It only worked for so long until the daughter-in-law demanded an autopsy. So yeah, with that being said, uh, that's pretty much it. That's all I have for this week, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. So with the play dead, will you regret everything that you did that you said? I don't think you understand what you're doing. And my heart's black and blue from the bruising. I feel like when I'm with you, I'm losing. I feel like you think that this amusing. Sitting there gaslighting and confusing. Was it me? Is it me? Am I deluded? I'm the one who's always sorry, the conclusion Even though I offer all of the solutions I wish you loved me like I love you, it's stupid When I'm alone with you, I never feel lucid 